get a review of what we're up to in the story, and then we could proceed. So the opening statement is the woman is singing to her beloved. That's the first few verses. And she's talking about how she wants the kiss and how she smells the fragrance and how she wants him to pull her and they will run together. So that's the, that's the first sort of the first series that gets us to verse four. Um, verse five and six, the conversation shifts. Now the conversation is between the woman and the daughters of Jerusalem. And she's saying, look, I, I'm, I'm black, but I'm also cal calmly, I'm also beautiful. I maybe look on the externally like the tents of Kedar, like the Arab tents, but in the, in the inside, I'm like the, the curtains of Solomon. We discussed what that represents. Do not look upon me because I'm swarth, swarthy um, for the sun has gazed upon me. In other words, don't judge me. Really, I'm beautiful. That was the, sort of the next series. So after she's speaking to her beloved, not face to face, she's speaking to her, to her, but he's not here. He's gone, but she's talking to her as if he's present. Then we, then, then we have her conversation with the other daughters of Jerusalem who she feels judged by. And last week or last time we discussed verse seven and eight. And verse seven and eight is very, very interesting. Verse seven, she's so in love. She says, tell me, where are you? Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where do you feed? In other words, where do you pasture? Where do you rest the flocks at noon? She's in love and she wants to know where, where, where he is. And we discussed this last time at length. I think it was last week. And that verse eight is his response to her. Basically, he's not telling her where he is. He says, okay, go, go look for me, go amongst the other, among, amongst the other shepherds. So he wants, she wants closeness, she wants uh, intimacy, she wants to be close to him. He is not ready, he's nowhere to be found. He won't even tell her where he is. So what happens next? Next is he doesn't wanna lose her, right? So he's got to tell her that he got. He's got. To, he has to praise her. He has to. He has to tell her that she's in love, and that's what verse 10, 9, 10, and eleven is uh, do. And that's what we're going to discuss today. And again, the story has multiple levels. There's the simple story, which is just you know the romance between the man and the woman. We have the historical perspective, and then we have the. In other words, it's an allegory to a historical perspective. And then we have the Kabbalistic and Hasidic perspective. So we're actually reading the story on four planes. But for a moment, let's just take the simple, most simple plane, the most simple level. He, she says, where are you? He's like, I, I, why do I have to look for you amongst the shepherds? He's like, if you can't find me, follow the sheep, look around, you go around the other shepherds, maybe you'll find me. He doesn't even say, maybe you'll find me. Basically keep looking. He's not, he's not, he's not ready to say where he is. But again, he wants the, 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 um, he wants the, he wants the relationship to live on, so he gives her, he, he, he tells her, he praises her. I'm still in love with you. Now, what's very interesting about these descriptions of love um, that we're going to discuss, or the praise, what's interesting and telling about them is, first of all, it's not clear exactly what they mean, at least according to the simple interpretation. Some of these you should not try at home. That's going to backfire. They're not, they sound a little strange to the modern ear, but that just makes it more interesting. Um, beyond that, it's very interesting that he does not praise her. He praises her, at least verse, at least verse 10 and 11, praises her jewelry, okay? Now, this changes later on, later in the story. Later in the story, later in the Song of Songs, you see great descriptions, romantic and erotic descriptions of the person, of her. Now, he's not there yet. So what is he saying? Well, you have beautiful jewelry. Okay, I don't know, I never had jewelry, but what happens if someone tells you, wow, you have a beautiful jewelry, wow, you're wearing a nice suit, wow, you're wearing a beautiful dress, okay? If they praise the dress, they don't play, praise you. Why is that? So obviously what they're trying to do is they're trying to feel close, they're trying to sh signal that they're interested, but they don't wanna to get that to, too intimate, at least not at this stage. So if I say you're beautiful, oh, that's much closer than, especially if I get descriptive as the book will get in the future chapters, but right now, he doesn't really say you're beautiful. He says, wow, you, you, your earrings look so beautiful on your cheeks. Okay, so you see what he's doing here. He's mentioning her, but in the context of the jewelry. So verse nine, we're gonna get to, we can't use this translation because it's a disaster, but verse 10 and 11, just for a second, your cheeks are comely with rose, your neck with necklaces. Okay, uh, we will make you rows of gold with studs of silver. So you see what he's doing is very clever. He's not saying you have beautiful cheeks and he's not saying you have a beautiful neck. He's gonna say it later, but we're not there yet. So what does he say? Wow, your neck looks so beautiful with the jewelry. 
Okay, so he's still staying external. It's less, it's less intimate, it's less direct because again, this relationship has to develop. And that's just a, on the practical level, you see it's so clear. It's not clear when you just look at verse one, but uh, chapter one, but if you compare chapter two to what's going to happen later, and you have, like I said, detailed descriptions, uh, erotic descriptions of the woman herself, and she gives to him of the man himself. But now it's the, we're still beating around the bush. We're still talking about jewelry, right? So that's in the simple story of how it develops. Of course, when it gets to the Kabbalistic and the, and the Hasidic, everything takes kind of different meaning. Now, verse nine is a funny verse because uh, they're, they're translating like Rashi, much better to, to, to go to simple meaning just to see what Rashi is doing here and to see how funny this verse is. Sounds to us, I, I would say, I'm going to go to a different translation from Safari. I have no idea where they get this from. In any case, this is the verse. I have likened you, my darling, to a mare, I think that's the pronunciation, which is a, a, I think, a female horse in Pharaoh's chariots. Okay, don't try this at home. Don't go home and tell your wife, you're as beautiful as the horse in Pharaoh's chariot. That is really what he's saying here to her. To her. And then he says, your cheeks are calmly with, with plated wreaths your neck with strings of jewels. Again, the jewelry, same idea. We will add wreaths of gold to your spangles of silver, meaning you have some jewelry, we're gonna give you more jewelry. Okay, beautiful. Um, okay, let's focus on verse on verse nine because it's the funniest. It's not the funniest, it's, it's strange. So to us, if you go home and tell your wife you're as beautiful as Pharaoh's horse, you're gonna be in trouble. But if you think about the context of the time that it was written and who wrote the book, then it starts making sense because a horse in the ancient world was a metaphor for strength, a metaphor for, um, not a metaphor, that was the source of the army, that was the, that, that's what, that is what, um, that was basically your, your army tank, and that was a sign of your strength. Also, we know that King Solomon wrote the book. We know about King Solomon, that one of his, um, one, of the, one of the spiritual downfalls, one of the things that led to his spiritual downfall is that he went and he cre cre created ties with the uh, kingdom of Egypt, and he also married the daughter of the Pharaoh. And one of the reasons for that is, is because of political reasons, he wanted to um, uh, get, get um, sort of, sort of um, unite his kingdom with the kingdom of Pharaoh because the, 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 the Egyptians exported the best horses. They had the best tanks. So he is obsessed with Egyptian culture and with Egyptian horses. So when they're writing the song and you wanna say how beautiful you are, oh, you're like the horse in the chariot of Pharaoh, in this context, like I said, it sounds strange. In the context of, 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 in the context of Solomon and times of Solomon, that's a form of praise. Having said that, uh, Rashi doesn't like that interpretation, and therefore Rashi plays around with this. Not plays around. He says, "Let's follow." Lisutati. This is the English, this is the translation, English translation according to Rashi. Not. Again, Rashi is doing two things. First of all, he's changing the simple meaning. He's also talking about the, the allegory. So I, we're gonna do both here for a second, but we'll start with the simple meaning and then go to the, the re, simple reading according to Rashi. Then we go to the allegory. What Rashi says is as follows. Not to this, not to the horse in Pharaoh's chariots, I have compared you. Not to. Rashi says the Lamed, the Lamed Lususati, which commonly would be translated as to the horse in Pharaoh's chariot, I, chariot, I have likened you, my beloved. We could change that to the, 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 the two could be at. That's what Rashi begins with. At the gathering of the steeds of Pharaoh's chariots, have I, let's, we'll stop, we'll start that. Hebrew Lusutati, the Lamed, the letter Lamed is like the Lamed in Jeremiah at the sound of is giving of multitude a multitude of waters. So Rashi is telling you that in biblical Hebrew, the word lit, even though it commonly it's two, it could also mean at. And now we change the whole thing. At the horses of Pharaoh's chariots. Ah, what does that tell us? What is that referring to? So we know, look through, come through the Bible. If you're reading the historical perspective, where do you have a gathering of cha Pharaoh's chariots? That's the gathering of the Red Sea. So the Jewish people leave Egypt. Pharaoh chases them. The Torah says he took 600 um, chariots. Those 600 chariots needed horses. And at that time, at the horses, at the, at the gathering of Pharaoh's horses, that's when God shows his love to the people. So you see what Rashi does. He changes the meaning of the Lamed, not you're compared to the horses of, 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 of Pharaoh, but at the horses of Pharaoh, at the chariot of Pharaoh, they're what? Again, 
what Rashi is going to do, I have um, Rashi is going to do instead of dimitich, which in the other translation, the more common translation would be, I have likened you, I have compared you. Rashi says that in biblical Hebrew, the term dome could be silence. Again, um, if you go back to the biblical reading, when you get to the to the story of the splitting of the sea, when the Jewish people chase the Egyptians. I'm sorry, when the Egyptians chase the Jewish people and Jewish people cry out to God. And there's a fascinating verse. The verse says, God tells Moshe, Ma li, do not, why are you screaming to me? Speak to the Jewish people and travel forward into the sea. And that's what they do. And Moshe tells the people, Hashem yilachem lachem, God will wage battle for you. And you shall be silenced and you shall be quiet. So here Rashi says that the word dimitich, I have um, the dimitich, which mean, which could mean I compared you, the word dome could be similar, but it could also mean silenced. And here we get to verse nine is the, is the translation of this verse, as explained by Rashi, at the gatherings of the steeds of Pharaoh's chariots, have I silenced you, my beloved? And here we get a little bit of Rashi. I don't want to spend too much time on, on, on just the interpretation of Rashi, but it's important. Um, there I, I'm going in the middle here, I'm pointing. There I silenced you, my beloved. I silenced you from your cry, as it is written in Exodus, and you shall be silent. Um, <clears throat> I saw in Agathic works, which is the Medrash Rabbah, another explanation, Dimitriati, there I demonstrated to all that you are my beloved. So it, Rashi, Rashi's a little uncomfortable to say Dimitich, which means I silenced you, because Dom is, is not the most common translation. So he says, you know what? At the gather, gathering of Pharaoh's chariots, I showed everybody, I brought you an example for my love. I made everyone see that you're my beloved. Okay, so we see what Rashi is doing. Rashi is saying that we're referring to the era of the splitting of a sea. Now, that helps for verse 10 and 11 as well, because why are we talking about jewelry? Well, what happened at the gathering, at the splitting of the sea, is that the Egyptians drown, and the verse explains, and the commentaries explain, the Medrash explains, that the Jewish people were able, when the Egyptians would go to war, they would put jewelry on the, on the warriors and as well as the, on the chariots and on the horses. And when the Jewish people, um, and, and when, the, when the Egyptians drown, the Jewish people loot, they take all the, the gold and silver from the, from the Pharaoh and his chariot, from the Egyptians and their chariots, and they call it the looting at the sea. And the Talmud says that the looting at the sea was greater than the looting of Egypt. Because when they left Egypt, they also borrowed gold and, gold and silver from their neighbors. But there was greater, um, they got greater wealth at the sea than they got at Egypt. And that, according to Rashi, is verse 11. Verse 11 says, I will make you rows of gold with the studs of silver, which means you already have studs of silver. And now the man says to his beloved, I'm going to give you also rows of gold, more jewelry. So gold is obviously more than silver. So the interpretation is very simple. The interpretation is when they left Egypt, they had some possessions of the Egyptians that was the gold. But at, this, at the gathering of the chariots of Egypt, at the splitting of the sea, there you got not only gold, but also not only silver, I'm sorry, silver and Egypt, they had silver. Now they're getting gold. And that's the metaphor for the jewelry. And that's the obsession of the jewelry because we're talking about the splitting of the sea where they get the where they also get, get the looting of Egypt. Just quickly to read it, and then we take um, um, the question. Your neck with necklaces, necklaces of gold with pearls strung of golden threads at, of the plunder of the sea. You see, that's the second second half of Rashi, number 10 and, the, um, and 11. We will make you rows of gold. I, I and my tribunal decided the, um, before the arrival of Pharaoh that I shall entice him and strengthen his heart to pursue you with all the best of his hidden treasures, so that we should make rows of golden ornaments for you with studs of silver that were already in your possession that you took out of Egypt for the plunder of the sea was greater than the plunder of Egypt. So that's what, that's what Rashi is saying. Rashi is saying that this is a metaphor too. Again, God wants to, just like in the simple story, the man is praising, praising his beloved saying, wow, you have beautiful jewelry. You're, like the, you're, you're, you're as beautiful as the horse and Pharaoh's chariot. The, 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 the historic reading is, God wants to remind us when the Jewish people are, are craving God's closeness, God reminds them and says, you remember, you remember how beautiful you were, how I showed and let everybody see at the sea how you're my beloved and how I bought you all that additional jewelry in addition to the jewelry that you already had when you were in the, when you were in the, when, when, when you left Egypt. So that's the, that's the first, that's the second reading already. We had a simple reading and then we have the historic reading. We have two more readings left. We'll see if we'll do just the Kabbalist. We'll do the Kabbalistic. We'll just go straight to the Hasidic. We'll see what the clock says. But go ahead. Question, please. Fega, please go ahead. 
Uh, thank you, Rabbi. Uh, I probably forgot, does Rashi do something with the pshat or usually? I mean, not here, but usually does he address the pshat first and then the allegory? A little bit, sometimes, when necessary, when necessary. Like in this case, you see um, that he's addressing the words before he gives the, alleg the, the allegory. In other words, he's giving, telling you what the word to means and what, yeah, but he does it sometimes. If you want an example, I'm gonna sc scroll earlier. Um, So he does it sometimes, but okay. not consistently. Correct, correct. Oh, thank you. I have to find it. It's hard for me just to read the English. If I had the Hebrew on the side, I would be a little quicker. We believe you, really. <laughs> no, it's, you don't have to believe me. You trust, trust your, you save, you save your, save your faith for other matters. Okay, yeah, he does it a few times. Okay, look at an example. There's an example in verse five. I am black but comely. You, my friends, let me not let let me not be light in your eyes, even if my husband has left me because of my blackness, for I am black because of the sun's gaze. Okay, I'm just reading a little bit more. And then once you go to five lines down, the allegory is that the congregation of Israel, you see what he's doing? First, he tells you the simple meaning, and then he gives you the allegory is that the Jewish people are speaking to the nations of the world. So that's an example where Rashi would do that. Not in this case, because that's going to be too hard. And yeah, it's in, the, in this case, in this case, it's too hard because, because mm -hmm. in the because simple, far. if Rashi is saying, right, in, in other words, if Rashi, I guess either it's going to be too hard or it's not necessary, right? Because you could say we're sitting here and, and it's hard for us to imagine that the guy is telling you to go, wow, you're beautiful as a horse. But maybe that's, maybe that, maybe that, maybe that made sense back then. So if that's the case, maybe it's, maybe it's simple. You're as beautiful, my beloved, you're as beautiful. I compared you to a horse in the chariot of Pharaoh. Okay, like I said, don't try this at home, but 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, maybe this would work, who knows? Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. Okay, so the journey continues. We want to go to the um, more mystical perspective, and we have a lot of Hasidic commentary here. We'll leave that for a second. Just going to give you a, try to do 60 seconds on, on a spiritual reading, which is, as we always point out, is not necessarily the, the Hasidic way of reading it, but the spiritual reading is as follows. When he says, yes, you're, you're like a horse in the chariot of Pharaoh. So let's just think about what the spiritual reading is doing. The spiritual reading is trying to highlight the pain of the beloved, the pain of the woman. In other words, she's yearning for something. And what is she yearning for? The problem is that she can't really get exactly what she wants because she wants to connect with and feel connected with spirituality. The problem is you can't really do that when, you're, when the soul is enclosed in the body because when the soul is enclosed in the body, then its consciousness is, everything it understands and sees is filtered through the 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 physical physical consciousness so she cannot she's trapped she cannot see the beloved she says i smell you but i can't sense you and that's really consistently what the spiritual interpretation is doing and it does so here as well so from the perspective of the man what is the man saying about god what does god say i see that you are like a horse amongst the chariots of pharaoh what is that highlighting that highlight that highlights the soul is trapped in the chariot of Pharaoh. In other words, it's pulling, it's, it's providing energy for the chariot of, of Pharaoh. It's horsepower for the chariot of Pharaoh. What does, that set, what does that tell you? That tells you that the soul's experience in this earth is sometimes that it's trapped in helping pursue goals that it is not comfortable with. Right? So for the soul to pursue just material existence is like you taking me, putting me to the chariot of Pharaoh, I'm almost trapped. And that's what the man is now saying from the perspe his perspective, he sees what's happening to the soul. Now, what's happening, we, we now we're in verse 10 and 11, we're praising the jewelry. What is jewelry? Jewelry is very nice, but jewelry is external. In other words, what the soul, what's happening to the soul is the soul is being burdened by the physical 
on beauty, but it's distracting her from her connection to spirituality. And just one more little detail that it says that now we have rows of gold together with studs of silver in verse 11. But the Hebrew, the studs of silver is nekudot hakesef. Literally, a nekudah means a dot, a dot of silver. And then as opposed to a row or a line of gold. So in the simple interpretation, the gold is superior to the silver. But in the spiritual interpretation, the opposite is true. Silver is more white, gold is more red, as we will discuss in a moment from the Kabbalistic perspective, from the Hasidic perspective. So white has a certain um, um, element of being undefined and spirituality is undefined. The same thing when you have a dot, a dot is undefined. So its quality is, its quality is quantitative. As opposed to a line, a line is already defined philosophically. And because it's defined, so its quality is its length. How long is it? When something has a quality, if, when something is qualita qualitatively um, unique, it's just a dot. And that represents, according to the spiritual interpretation, the soul used to be a dot of gold. A dot means it's a white, more whitish, undefined, and it's only a dot. It doesn't need space. It doesn't have dimensions because existence was spiritual. Now, when it becomes, it joins the chariot of Pharaoh. Now, when the body, when the soul now becomes energy to fuel the physical existence, it feels that, that, that sense of being trapped. Now, in addition to have its spiritual dimension, which is likened to the dot of gold, now it has a line of silver, silver is red, silver is passion, but it's but it but but it's it's more colored. If it's colored, it's defined. It's more physical, and of course, there's a line because everything in, in the physical world has a dimension, and that's and that's the that, that's the that's the metaphor of the line. So that's a little bit philosophical, but I don't want to spend too much time in that because what I'm really here for is my hidden agenda or not so hidden agenda is the Hasidic Hasidic dimension. So that is where we will go. So as we mentioned before, that 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 uh, part of what's happening here is the man is praising the woman, but he's doing so praising the jewelry, saying, praising the horse, praising the cheeks, but really praising the rose, which is really earrings hanging from the cheeks, he's pr not really praising the neck, praising the necklace. Um, from the spiritual, from the Hasidic perspective, what this praise is, it's referring, of course, to the Jewish people, the, the soul, the way the soul is in this world, and specifically referring to the qualities of the soul when it comes to serving God. That's the jewelry. The jewelry is the ser serving God. So when you say you have beautiful jewelry, what you're really saying is your service of God is beautiful. And now we have to unpack uh, the specific details. I'll start with verse 9, even though it's probably the most abstract, but verse 10 and 11 is a little bit more concrete, I hope. Verse nine to the to the to the we're going to take the simple interpretation, not to the gatherings, but the, to the horses of Pharaoh's chariot. You are compared. I compared you, my beloved, and this brings into the met metaphor of what does the horse represent? And if you look look from the spiritual perspective, from the Kabbalistic perspective, the horse has a very specific uh, meaning. And if you talk about animals, I don't want to get into the right now the Kabbalah of animals, but really the Haftorah of the first day of Shavuot, which we just celebrated on Sunday is Ezekiel seeing the chariot of God. Chariot of God is the formation of angels and the energies of the angels. And there we have the descriptions of various animals. There's the horse, there is the lion, there is the ox, there is the eagle. There are different animals and the various animals represent various energies. But there it does not mention the horse. Only in the later prophets does it talk about the metaphor of God's angels and the, the me metaphor of the horse. So the Kabbalah talks about what is the difference between the other angels and the horse, but we're going to try to stay simple and try to get in and out of this verse relatively quickly. The horse, from the Kabbalistic perspective, let's think about the relationship between the horse and the rider. And if you think about the horse-rider relationship, is the horse has a lot of strength, physical strength, and the horse is really takes the rider to rear the rider. Okay, let's start from the beginning. The horse, who's serving who, right? Um, the horse, on one hand, is being controlled by the rider. Um, the horse will only go where the rider wants it to go. 
So who's the who's who's the leader? The leader is the who's in charge. In charge is the rider. On the other hand, even though the horse is being controlled, on the other hand, uh, the relationship between the horse and the rider is such that the that the horse will take the rider to where the rider cannot go on his own. So in other words, the sort the horse is the one leading because this horse can get the horse the, the horse can get you where the rider cannot get you. So there's this form of a relationship between the rider and the horse. And Kabbalistically speaking, horse represents um, letters or words. Other animals represent emotion, but I don't want to get into that. The horse represents, be with me for a minute for this metaphor here. So the horse represents letters or words. When I say letters or words, I mean letters or words meaning without emotion. I say words, or sometimes horse can also mean I do action. But let's let's talk about the words for a minute. I say words. Let's think about the relationship between the words and the ideas that the words contain, right? Because that's what really what we're thinking about. So what is a word? A word is a vehicle to express either an idea or an emotion, right? Most people, sometimes people speak and their words have no content whatsoever. Hopefully uh, there's not too much of that, but usually when a person speaks, the, I, the words are here to convey an idea or an emotion. Now, so what is the horse? The horse is just a vehicle. What is the word? It's just a vehicle to convey something. So I want to say, I want to convey an emotion. I want to say, I love you. So I say, I love you. The words, the words mean nothing. It's just, it's just a vehicle. And sometimes you can have the vehicle without the emotion, right? I could say, I love you, and I don't really mean it. So, or you can say words to me, or an idea, if you want to think about an idea, you're telling me words, which is an idea, but I don't understand the concept behind the idea. I don't have the training to be able to assimilate and accept what you're saying. So you're giving me a wonderful idea, but what I'm getting is just plain words. That's the horse. The horse is the words without just the actual words, without the emotion or the feeling, without the emotion or the idea invested within them. In other words, it could be that you have them, but they're concealed. I don't see that. I just see the horse. Now, but then there's a, something interesting about words that the Kabbalah highlights, and it's you see this in you, you could see this practically speaking. Everybody could see this from their own experience. What's interesting about words is that the words, the horse, could actually intensify the experience. Even though till now we're saying, what is a word? What is a word? I say, I love you. What is it? It's just an expression of the idea. It's just serving the idea. It's serving the idea, but just like the horse is being led and being a chariot for the person, it also serves the person. It also intensifies the person's experience. And therefore, says the Kabbalah, you will see in, in the practical reality of life that words have the power to, 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 to intensify a feeling or an emotion. If I feel something, but I don't give it, if I don't express it, ultimately that feeling may subside. But if I say I love you, even if I don't necessarily uh, experience the intensity of that love, if I talk about it, or write about it, if I articulate it in words, that experience will intensify the feeling. And of course, the same thing is, is true with about emotion, but the same thing is true also about an idea. If I have an idea, it could be a wonderful idea, I can understand it, but if I have to articulate it in words to somebody else or to myself, if I have to write it down, that idea will become crystallized. And that's the notion of, of the horse. And because again, it's that double relationship. I'm being led, I'm just serving you. The horse is just serving the rider, but the horse actually um, contributes to the rider in the sense that it gives it a lot more strength and it intensifies the experience. So what does this mean? This means in simple English that when we serve God, when we pray, when we study Torah, when we do an action that does not but we don't feel the emotion because, again, now the soul is down here in this world. We don't always feel the emotion of connection to God when we pray. We don't always feel the emotion of connection to God when we study Torah. We don't always feel the intense emotion of connection to God when we do a good deed. Nevertheless, what God is saying, when he looks at his beloved, he says, do not underestimate the horse. Do not underestimate the dry action or the dry word because the horse ultimately will raise you to a place that and intensify the feeling of the emotion to the extent that the tangible, the tangibility of the action and the tangibility of the um, articulation is going to intensify it and make it much stronger. So that's in short what the Kabbalah is going to say about verse 9. 
I want to really get to verse 10 and 11. So let me speak a little bit about verse 10 and 11, and then we'll take questions on verse 9, 10, and 11. What is verse 10 talking about? Verse 10 tells you that there is a earring on the mouth, on the, on the cheek. Your cheeks are comely with rows. What is a row? Row means a row of jewelry. And, um, and then your neck with necklaces. So what we're going to try to do is talk about what is the earring and what is the necklace. We're also going to talk about the gold and the silver, but we'll hold that for a second. So, but specifically, oh, whoops, I'm not, I'm not, oh, I'm not, I wasn't sharing the screen. I thought I was. Okay, so we'll look at verse 10 for a second. Your cheeks are comely with rows. Rashi says rows of earrings and golden forehead plates. Okay, we'll talk about the earring. And your neck with necklaces. Okay, what does rose mean? What type of earring was this? So the word tor, nabulachayach bat tor, has a specific meaning. And in many contexts in the Mishnah, for example, a tor is a triangle. So you have three rows. Rashi translates it as rows, rows of, of, of jewelry, I guess, on the ears. But, well, on the cheeks hanging from the ears. But really, rows, what do you have rows? Rows is three rows. When you have three rows, you have a triangle. So think about the image. He's praising her earrings, and she's bought, she has uh, triangles. And that's really what we're going to get to. Verse 11 is very similar. We will make you rows of gold with studs of silver. And I said to that earlier that studs of silver, the stud is really a dot. So basically, what's happening here is you have a triangle. And the triangle, you have the three points. That is the, that is the, that, that are the, those are the, those are the studs. You have three studs, but three studs are really three dots. The studs are of silver, but the lines connecting the three studs are of gold. So think about it. You go to the jeweler and you say, look, I got three silver studs. And he says, you know what? Your husband tells you, you know what? I'm going to buy you because your studs are so beautiful. The three dots of silver are so beautiful. I'm going to buy you rows of gold to add to the studs and we're going to make ourselves a triangle so in other words according to the Kabbalah, according to the hasidic interpretation 10 and 11 interact when we say how beautiful are your earrings in other words comely your rows how beautiful are your cheeks with the triangle verse 11 gives us more information about the triangle triangle has the studs of silver with the rows of gold why am i telling this to you not because i'm a jeweler but because of the spiritual significance here now, when you talk about a triangle and three dots, so right away, I talk about in the context of the service of God. So the Kabbalah says that in general, we know that Judy, that the service of God could be divided into three categories. And that's why we have the triangle here. Triangle represents all the various um, ways of connecting to God. And in, um, first say it the way the Mishnah says it, and then I'll say it the way that the, what, it, what, it, what it means in, the, in terms of the Kabbalah. So the Mishnah says that the world stands on three things, meaning our relationship with God stands upon three things. Torah, Avoda, which is service, which is the, either the offerings, and now that there's no temple, it's prayer, and Gemilut Chasadim, and acts of kindness. So we have three, we have three studs, we have three um, um, founding pillars, foundational pillars that hold up the world. And that is, like I said, Torah, then you have prayer, and then you have prayer or, or the sacrifices, which is the same idea, you're trying to become close to God, and Gemilut Chasadim, act of kindness. So that's what, the, that's what the Mishnah says. Kabbalistically speaking, what does this mean in a relationship? A relationship has really three dimensions. One is I am drawn to you. That is prayer. I want to go upward. According to the Kabbalah, you talk about, you talk about uh, um, which, how is, how, what direction am I, am, I, am I headed toward? Prayer is I want to elevate myself to you or to God. That's what the Kabbalah will call, will call from below to above. That's prayer. I'm going upward. Then you have a different direction. Doing good deeds in this world is that I'm flowing in the other direction. I'm not trying to become more spiritual. I'm not trying to become closer to God. To the contrary, I'm trying to become, I'm trying to affect the world. And I'm trying to affect the world. That's the, that's the meaning of drawing down from above to below. The flow is in a different direction, right? And then the Torah is somehow the, the blend of the two. Because what is the idea of the Torah? The idea of the Torah is not to try to become only to become spiritual, also not necessarily to affect the world. It's really trying to blend the, the earth and the heaven. What do I mean? I mean, I want to align my life in this world consistent with the, 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 with the will of God, which is heaven. So in other words, I'm not trying to escape. I'm not trying to go up. 
And I'm also not trying to affect the world per se. I'm not trying to, to help this world per se. What I'm trying to do is give me an experience where when I'm down here, I should be aligned with the divine will. That's sort of the combination of going up and the going down. What are we saying here? We're saying here is that so I'm going to try. I'm going to try to translate this in in, in, in another way. But first, I'll tell you what the Kabbalah is, what, what 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 the Kabbalah is saying, and then I'm going to try to explain it more in practical terms. So what the Kabbalah is saying is like this: the praise of the Jewish person is that this this three three dimensional relationship with God, up, down, and the blend of the two. What's unique about this verse is that we have here a triangle. What does a triangle mean? It means that it's not three distinct attitudes. But all these three ex distinct attitudes could be experienced simultaneously. So we know the Kabbalah, I don't want to go into this too much. We know the Kabbalah is very into the idea of the different emotions have to be integrated with each other. We don't like extreme emotions. We don't like just love or just respect. We like the integration. But here, it's a very similar concept. So what we're saying here is there's three ways to experience, to experience there's, there's generally, there's different ways of experience, experiencing a relationship. One hand, on one hand, the relationship is you feel the different emotions at different times. That's the standard relationship. Sometimes I feel close. Sometimes I feel like I need my space. Sometimes I want to love you. Sometimes I want to respect you. If you want to talk about children, it's even easier to understand. Sometimes I feel the love. Sometimes I feel discipline, right? I feel like I, I, I don't like your behavior. I have to try to do something to, to, to discipline you, to change you. And you feel all the emotions at distinct times distinct times. That is the standard emotion. That's the standard relationship. The praise here that God is giving the Jewish person is that you have a one earring that has the lines, a triangle that connects all three, right? Verse 11 means you went to the jeweler. You had three studs of silver. And what the, what the, what, what the husband says, what the man says, you know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to do for you. I'm going to connect the three studs of silver with the triangle of gold. In other words, with the lines of gold that connect all three. So what does this mean? So gold, we mentioned earlier that silver is more white, more plain, and gold is represents represents repre, represents uh, is closer to a reddish color. And in the Kabbalah, there's different forms of love love to God. There's different shades of love, and some love is I feel close to you. Some, but there's passionate love. Passionate love is gold. So when I love you, but I don't feel the love so strongly, then I will feel the different elements of the emotion of the relationship separately. If, the, if I have gold, if the love is intense, then I will feel the triangle. I will feel all three simultaneously. And I hope I'm not talking too abstract. I want to try to give you a simple metaphor. Let's talk about parent-child metaphor. That will be easier for, for, this, for this purpose. And then we go to spouse metaphor because that is really what the Song of Songs is, is talking about. If I don't feel the intense love to my child, then in the morning, I, whatever, at one moment, I feel love and I feel like I want to go and buy them ice cream. Assuming that's a good thing. I don't know that it is. Then at another point when they get me upset, I feel I need discipline. Now, do I love them at the time? Of course I love them at the time, but I don't feel the love. I feel the discipline. If my love, that's if I have gold. If I have, if I have, that's if I have silver. If I have gold, if the love is intense, you can get to the point that even when you are disciplining your child, you're feeling an intense love. So why are you disciplining? Because that's what the child needs. So you're in a state of discipline. Discipline means don't try to feel close to the child. Feel, show the child that you're distant from the child. Show the child that you're not happy with where they are. Show the child that there's a gap between where the child is and where he needs to go. Create the gap, create the distance. That's really essentially what, what discipline is. But I could do both. I could create that sense of distance and yet feel the love simultaneously, provided that what I feel is not ordinary love, but extraordinary love. Not love of silver, but love of gold. And that is really what Rabbi Shneir Zaman is telling us what's happening in this verse. We're praising in verse, like I said, verse 10 talks about the triangle. And verse 11 talks about the, the adding the lines of, of gold to the dots of silver. Your gold is going to be able to create the three distinct dots to, in, into a triangle. Now, the same thing is with the relationship with, between spouses. So we always talk about the fact that a relationship, um, 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 unlike what the West tells you, the love is not enough. The love is just one wing. You need at least two wings and you really need the blend of the third, but let's talk about, let's start with two. Let's start with the easy. And you need both love and, and respect. What is respect all? What is respect? Respect is the idea. What love is I want, I want to feel close. So I want to pray. I want to elevate myself. I want to feel close to you. But I ultimately, I have to understand that we are 
different and I have to respect the differences. And just because I want something at this point, you may not want it at this point. And that's really also, also part of what this entire book is about, how the love of the man to the woman and the woman to the man, it's a timing, they don't always get the timing right because sometimes what one spouse needs, the other spouse doesn't want that at that time. And you have to learn to respect that. Respect is sense and, repre and, and respect the, dif the distance between the two. So sometimes I feel close to you. I say, I wanna go on a jog with you. I wanna sit on the couch with you. I wanna get close to you, but that's not what you need. You need me to go to the store and buy, and buy, and buy, and buy, and buy the ingredients for dinner. So that's respect. Loving means I wanna feel close, but respect means I wanna respect what you need. And the relationship needs both. The person who has an intense love is able to feel the same closeness when they're distant, when they sense the respect, simultaneously with the respect, feeling just as close when I am close to when I am distant. When I'm close to you, if I can sense the sense, same sense of closeness that I have when we're sitting on the couch as when I'm going to respect your wishes and not do what I want, but do what you want and respecting the differences. But if I can feel just as close, that means that love is intense. And that's what we're trying to get here. We're trying to get here. We don't want a relationship where we have three distinct states of mind. We want, when you have an intense emotion and that's what God is, is praising the Jews. Sometimes we pray. Sometimes we go out the world to do good deeds. We go to work. Why do we go to go to work? We go, going to work is essentially for Gminut Hasadim to do good, good deeds, either because my work directly is good deeds or so I can gather the means to be able to do good deeds in this world. So we don't want a, a split personality. It's not that when I pray, I'm one person. When I pray, I want to come close to God, I'm one person. But then when I want to impact the world, I'm, some, I'm somebody else. That's also good, but that's only silver. If you have the gold, you have a triangle. I am the same person when I'm in the synagogue as I am in the office. I'm the same person when I'm trying to come close to God as not the same person. I, I feel the same when I try to become close to God as when I am trying to impact the earth, the world even though I'm in a different space and I'm flowing in a different direction, I'm not flowing upward, I'm flowing downward. I'm still feeling the same intensity and the same closeness. And that's because of the triangle. So that's about the earrings. Now let's talk about the necklace. The necklace, the, the neck is, 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 is strung together by charuzim. Charuzim literally means it's really the string that strings it all together. So today we call necklace, but that really what it's called is, is charuz is to take that, that, that thread and thread together various stones and various pieces of jewelry. And in Hebrew, the word charuzim could mean, it could, it's funny, it could mean anything. In the Mishnah, you talk about a, uh, you can buy a, a necklace, a ring of fish is called charuzim also. Macharozet, macharozet, rings of fish. It doesn't matter what you're stringing together. In this context, it means you're stringing together jewelry. But the point is here, you're taking a string and you're connecting many different things together. And that's the beauty of the, of the earring. So of, of, the, of the necklace. So once we explained the state of mind of the Jewish person, verse, the first half of the verse, how beautiful are your cheeks with the earrings, the, with, the, with the triangle earrings, which represents the fact that you have all three perspectives. You can feel all three perspectives simultaneously. I feel the love when I, together with the respect. It's not today I love you, tomorrow I respect you. Today I wanna be close, tomorrow I, 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 I wanna give you your space. But together with this sense, sensing the differences and respecting you, I can simultaneously feel the love. Now let's talk about the Jews' other purpose, how the Jew affects the world. And we, what if, when we affect the world, what we're essentially doing is we're essentially making a necklace. What are we doing? We're taking various stones. What is a stone? A stone is something physical. But to, be, to create the true beauty, you have to drill a hole through the stone. And then you have to string it with a string. So what does it mean, drill a hole? Drill a hole would mean you have to insert a purpose, insert meaning, insert spirituality into each of the stones of your life. And when, then when you thread it together, means you're connecting it to a, to a different story. Now the stone is not an individual stone, it's part of a greater story. And throughout our day, what we're really doing is we're threading a necklace th up through our daily experiences and our physical possessions. You can look at your physical possessions. I have a house, I have a car, I have a shirt, I have a, I have a pair of pants, I have a boat. Okay, but each one is distinct, but that's not a necklace. A necklace is if you could find meaning and say this, all of this together comes together for a higher purpose so I can become a better person and serve God. What you're doing is you're inserting that string, that meaning, that purpose, stringing it together, making a necklace, allowing the stone to tell a deeper story. And that, according to Abishner Zalman, is the verse meaning of verse, of verse 11, or was it 10? Verse 10 
is going back to first talking about the Jew's own service of God, his own state of mind, and then the impact on the world. So how your cheeks are comely with rows and your neck with necklaces. Savarech bacharuzim. The necklaces is your, so the cheeks are comely with rows. What is cheeks? Um, Talmud says that cheeks is also a reference to the Torah study. Torah study, we speak through words. Remember, that's like really connection to nine. Nine, we said the horses are the words. So the cheeks are also the, the words we speak, the words of the Torah. And that's why cheeks plural, because there's really two Torahs. There's the written Torah, there's the oral Torah. So we can keep going in, into the details and talking about every detail. But the big picture is that we're, re we're referring to the triangle, and that's the person's own relationship with God. I feel the, all the different dimensions of the relationship um, simultaneously. That's the praise that God praises the Jew. And the next step is your neck with necklaces, you're making a necklace. You're taking the stone. The stone is something just, it's just brute physicality. It's a nice stone just because, you know, diamonds are really not that unique. It's just that the beers decided that they're unique. So they control, control the flow and now it becomes expensive. In other words, it's not, it's, it's, it's just a, a piece of physicality. We're going to string it together, make a hole, insert the meaning and connect that piece of meaning with the rest of our life and the rest of our purpose. And that is the spirituality, the Kabbalah of the necklace. So that really should be the title of this class, the Kabbalah of the, of the necklace and the Kabbalah of the earrings. Of course, the lesson is you should buy more jewelry, both phys, um, figuratively, but also literally, but more importantly, figuratively. That's the story in short. A lot, a lot, a lot, to, a lot. We put out a lot out here. Some things are easier to, to relate to. Some things are more abstract. But I, th I thank you very much for joining. Any comments or questions, please share. Just a quick question, Rabbi. We, before that, we talk, I don't guarantee to give any answers, but questions are welcome. Of yeah. course not, especially yeah. when we're talking about jewelry. Right. Um, uh, before you said that the, in a way, silver was superior to gold because it was one dimension versus two dimensions, and you know, in talking about spirituality and the oneness of God, you would think it would be a demotion to take a separate individual one-dimensional stones and suddenly string them together to kind of imply a two-dimensional more earthly uh, as opposed to spiritual experience. Excellent. On that? excellent point, excellent observation. So that's what I try. The only reason why I brought in the spiritual interpretation is because I want to contrast that with the Kabbalistic, with the Hasidic. So the spirit, from the spiritual perspective is the more you have, the more physical and the more physical, the less beautiful. The soul is complaining. I used to be just a dot. I was undefined. Now you're forcing me to become a line to take a on, on physical form. And that's part of the pain of the soul. And the re only reason why I told you this is because I want to show what the Hasidic, Hasidic perspective is doing. Hasidic perspective is rejecting that notion. Not that it's not true, but it's true that in some sense, if you're spiritual, you're one dimensional. However, there is a certain beauty in the plurality joining into oneness. And that's a big Hasidic idea. A big Hasidic idea is why does God create the world? God is one. Why does he create the world? Because one is, is one doesn't say oneness. Oneness means when you have plurality and the plurality says oneness, then you have oneness. So the metaphor I give is, let's say I come into the room and everybody agrees with me. You know why everyone agrees with me? Because there's no one else here, right? So I'm, I'm a very likable guy. Everybody can get along with me if I'm the only one in the room. That doesn't mean anything. That's God's oneness before the world was created. So what does God do? God packs the world with number two. Number two represents plurality. And there's division. And there's different perspectives. And, our, and the whole world is represented by multiplicity. Not just plurality, but multiplicity is the right word. And then if you could re realize that the multiplicity within creation is really combined with a necklace and really is an expression of the oneness of God, that is the true beauty. The true beauty is not one dimensional. The true beauty is when the multiplicity says the unity. And that's a major Hasidic idea of why the world was created. And it also, by the way, it also relates to what science is doing now. In other words, if you talk about the development of science and how the development of science is in line with, with the revelations of the Kabbalah, because what is science? It used to be people thought that there were many forces in nature. And how many, depending on the period of time, they classified as so many. As time goes on, especially in the, 19, in the 20th century and now in the 21st century, what we're realizing is that there are fewer and fewer forces. And really, we're looking for the oneness. We're looking for the unifying theory. We're looking for one theory to explain all the diverse multiplicity in the world. Why are we doing that? Because that, it just feels right. It feels that it's true. And, but the truth is, 
like Hasidic philosophy explains, that, the, that that is a real truth because ultimately the multiplicity in this earth really is really a testament to the oneness of God. How so? What looks to be so like 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 so many various trillions and trillions of, of, of universes are really all the expression of the oneness of God. He can express himself in so many different ways. But to do that, you need you, you, you need you need you need a necklace and you need to string them all together. And that is really, I would say, a debate between the spiritual perspective and the Hasidic perspective. The spiritual perspective says multiplicity is painful. And the Hasidic perspective says, no, multiplicity is beautiful, provided you create the harmony between the multiplicity. All those, all those stones are going to be confusing in your life. But if you string them together, that's the true beauty. So Robert, you put, Bob, you put, you put, you put your finger exactly on, 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 the, on, on the point, because like I said, it's not that one perspective is true and one perspective is not true. In its sense, for the soul, it's a painful experience to come to a world of multiplicity. However, it goes to a deeper level, it goes to the Hasidic level, and then it learns that there's a certain beauty in the multiplicity if you can create the necklace. Again, the Kabbalah of the necklace. Beautifully put. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Wonderful Shabbos, everybody. And come back next week, because next week, what happens next week? You ever try to compliment somebody? What are they, what, what, what happens? Again, we're talking about people that they're still trying to test their relationship. He's trying to compliment her, but he's not that close. He doesn't want to be, get too intimate. So he says, your jewelry is beautiful. Oh, no, no. He says, your face is very beautiful with the jewelry. Your neck is very beautiful with the necklace. So as, as, like I said earlier, there's not so much intimacy here because he's, he's afraid to go in and, and really talk about her. He talks about the jewelry. So what happens if you, if you, if you uh, praise somebody and they're not 100% comfortable? You know what's going to happen? What are they going to say? Not that beautiful. <laughs> okay? And that's exactly what happens next week. She says, I'm not that beautiful. Now, why does she say I'm not that beautiful? Because she wants his response. And you know what he says? No, 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 you are beautiful. And you know what happens? Of course. <laughs> and you know, and what happens when he says you are beautiful? The next time she he is forced to upgrade. He can't say, You have a beautiful shirt, you have beautiful jewelry. What is he gonna say next? Next time he's gonna say, You are beautiful, not the jewelry. I'm just gonna share it just to see where we're headed. Right. So verse 12, according to the, the traditional interpretation, it's she's saying, I'm not so beautiful. Um, so we have another few verses. Verse 15. Behold, you are comely. Comely is beautiful. My beloved, behold, you are comely. Your eyes are like doves. Finally, ah, finally, finally, finally. She has to come and say, I'm not beautiful. You're beautiful. She tells him, I'm not beautiful. You're beautiful. And then in verse 15 is. He says, no, 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 you're beautiful, and it's your eyes that are beautiful. Now, what exactly is happening here? You have to come back next week to figure out the next stage in the conversation here between in the, in the relationship between the man and the woman. And we're almost at the end of verse of, of, of chapter one, which is a nice, a nice, a nice uh, chunk of time. In other words, we're, we're, we're making progress. We still have eight chapters left, so we're still going to be able to be kept busy for a little while. But it's just fascinating how... One of the most interesting things here is how this story unfolds both on the physical level and on the spiritual level and on the capitalistic level on simultaneously. So here, as you see, your just the conversation, your, 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 your jewelry is beautiful. She doesn't want to hear that. So she says, I'm not beautiful. You're beautiful, she tells him. And he tells her, no, 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 you are beautiful. Your eyes are comely. Your eyes are like, are like doves, etc. as we mentioned before. Um, one, one of the ways to upgrade the love is to upgrade the expression of love is to force it by pushing back. When you push back, you put up some resistance, the other person is forced to, 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 to move closer. And that's one of the tricks that we learn from the Song of Songs. Thank you, everybody. Okay, wonderful day, wonderful Shabbos. And, uh, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so much.